Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching the Salty Sea, and today I'm going to talk about battle traits and list building with battle traits. Now, this video is going to go up on to Goonhammer about a week after it comes out of my channel. I'm very excited for that. Goonhammer is sort of the uh, paper of record of Wargaming, so I'm excited to be able to kind of show Warcry to the more general audience. And so I've put on that site a few articles about my sort of reactions. There are a few other folks who have put their reactions to the various battle traits that have come out for Warcry. But in case you haven't heard of what they are, let me show you an example of a battle trait. Uh, here is the Skaven one. There are always more. At the end of battle rounds two and three, you can pick a friendly fighter with this battle trait that is taken down and has a points cost of 70 or less. At the start of the next battle round, you can place that fighter on a platform or on the battlefield floor more than six inches from each enemy fighter, objective, and treasure token, and within three inches of, more, of one or more battlefield edges. So battle traits are something that you get if all of your fighters share the exact same faction rune mark. You get a fun little passive ability, and they wrote... 57 of these or something like that. There's a bajillion of them. And I'm just going to focus on list building for seven that I found sort of most interesting. Uh, I think there's about, really, there's about 25 uh, out of that 57 that I think are pretty cool and interesting and worth building around. But I had to stop somewhere. Let me know in the comments uh, which battle traits you find most interesting, and uh, maybe we'll be able to take a look at them on, in a video at a future time. Um, but let's start with Skaven. And the reason I want to start with Skaven is because this one is the most wild one out of the whole bunch. Um, the <laughs> There are always more. I just read it. But the way I'd want to build out of it, if we're sort of the world is our oyster, we can use any Skaven model. Uh, I would go with the Rat Rainbow is what I'm calling it. So Skabic Plague Seeker. Now, if you just make a fancy you know, weird looking <laughs> plague priest, something like that, uh, then you can call that your Skavic Plague Seeker. He doesn't have to be the real one. Uh, then a Storm Fiend. Uh, you can use either the Doom Flayer Gauntlets or the Grinder Fists. Both are really good. Uh, then a Rat Ogre. Again, you can really do the Shooty Rat Ogre or the Melee Rat Ogre. Both are very solid. Then Rabidius Skench. Uh, that is a weird little guy who's wrapped up in bandages from uh, the Nurgle or Pestilence Skaven Underworlds team. Then a Storm Vermin, just a regular old Storm Vermin with the shield. A Pack Master to combo with your Rat Ogre. And then uh, Crouched, who is another weird little guy. Any gutter runner can work to be Crouched. Crouched is just like a, a weird little gutter runner from the uh, Eshin Underworld's Warman. But there's a lot to like about playing with Skaven in the new kind of battle trait system. The main one being that you get kind of hilarious clan rat tactics, right? So you get to uh, resurrect at the end of battle rounds two and three. And so you can <laughs> just kind of... Because you have six inch move with your cheap fighters, you can force them down your opponent's throat. You can tie up your opponent's big offensive threats so they can't move around. Um, and so you can kind of pin your opponent in their deployment zone sometimes. You can do a lot of really wild blocking with that. And then they'll die, yes, but then you just get them back. And then you can do it all over again, which is wild. So any mission where um, the opponent doesn't get sort of free points just for killing a model in a random deployment zone area. Uh, you can just abuse this mechanic over and over, well, over twice, right? Um, the other cool thing about, I think, running with Packmasters, now I've heard some rumors that Packmasters will eventually get squatted uh, from Warcry. Take that with whatever grain of salt you want. We know that they're at least in the game for another year. Uh, but the Rat Ogre sort of builds for Skaven have been always really good, but one of the sort of Achilles heels of them is that you can never keep your pack masters alive long enough to just keep getting the whips over and over with the Rat Ogre. And now you really can. So you can either use your pack master as a screaming blocking threat, or you can use it to kind of follow around your Rat Ogre, and now your opponent is like desperate to take out your pack master. Um, 
you can kind of go either way with this sort of build. And then Crouched is just there because he has one more attack than a Clan Rat. Now the Clan Rat does have one plus one toughness, and in a lot of situations that's better. But here, when you kind of want it to die anyway, why not have the extra attack? Um, stress out your opponent, make your opponent really want to kill the thing, right? Crouched, running into their face round one, and then doing eight attacks uh, in round two is kind of annoying for your opponent, and so there's a there's good reason for them to want to take him out, which then uh, gives you that recycling, which is so amazing. Uh, the other really strong thing about this list, beyond like what you can do with your kind of silly chaff tactics, um, part of the reason I want you to play two here is because uh, you'll almost never need to have one in every deployment zone, but you'll want in any mission where there's two, you're going to want to have one no matter what. And then if there's, you know, if you're going to an event where there's deployments where only one is on the field, uh, you can usually look to make sure that um, you just don't have the one deployment that's alone not have a uh, clan rat equivalent in there. I'm calling these clan rat equivalents because... Uh, they're just, they have more utility than regular clan rats do, even though they cost the same amount, and they're doing the exact same thing most of the time. But the other amazing thing about this list is just how much beef you have. Storm Fiends are incredibly powerful in terms of just, like, how fighty they are, really. Uh, and then Rat Ogres are, you know, much easier to take down, but they still just hit for 4-8, and 4-8 is just a wild damage profile. Anytime you're doing 4 damage, 8 wounds, um, or 8 crit. Uh, so you can also squeeze 2 Storm Fiends in here. Um, if you turn Rabidius Skench into a Pack Master, and then you turn, um, or sorry, or like a Storm Vermin, and then you turn Skabic into a Great Seer, you can do 2 Storm Fiends. Uh, you can also do if you do turn Rabidius Skench into a pack master or another clan rat, uh, then you can have room for a plus one attack blessing on a storm fiend. That gives you even more reason to go with, say, the grinder fists because they've already got uh five strength, and so you can do that. Or actually, you just get there quicker by just adding plus one strength to the doom flare gauntlets. So, um that can give you more points to play around with to maybe bless up the Rat Ogre or something like that. So there's a lot that you can do with the Skaven trait. I would start with the list I've shown you, of course, um, but the reason I'd start with that is because Skabic and Rabidius uh, and Crouch kind of give you that extra utility, but you can really play around with it. You can drop some of the uh, fancy Underworld fighters if you want, and you can get a lot done with Skaven. I think that the Rats are really here to stay, the uh, <laughs> the trait feels like it's almost designed for the Skaven Tide box in that clan rats are just sort of so perfect with it. Now, Underworlds does make you not want to run clan rats, but you can still get a lot done with them. So you could say, just have the Skaven Tide box, play three rat ogres, a gray seer, two clan rats, and then you have room for a plus one attack blessing on one of your rat ogres. Um, or you have room, you could put strength blessings on two of the rat ogres, something like that. Uh, but this list would just have so much beef. Three Rat Ogres is insane. Uh, yes, you only have six fighters, but you can get away with that because you just deal so much damage, and that's a great place to be. Bone Splitters. I have badmouthed Bone Splitters so much on this channel, but it's time for me to finally apologize. Um, bone Splitters have one of the coolest battle traits. Uh, Primal Beliefs. When a player whose warband has this battle trait makes an initiative roll, before initiative is determined, they can re-roll each one. So there's a bunch that you can do here. Uh, one is if you just kind of only have one one and you just have a sort of a group of other stuff, uh, you can just roll that one and hope to get more crazy abilities. Um, you'll get a lot more rampages, things like that, that way. Um, you can get lots more sort of doubles and triples that way. The other thing you can do is if you rolled a bunch of ones and you actually want to win initiative, like let's say you have triple ones, um, but you really wish you'd won initiative. Well, you can re-roll those ones 
and that'll get you uh, just like way more chances at singles. And that can be really powerful too. So um, you just get a really unprecedented level of control over your initiative rolls without necessarily needing more wild dice. Uh, I kind of think of it as kind of getting half a wild dice every round because of kind of the extra utility it can buy you. And two wild dice for free is just like ridiculously powerful, right? Um, and so that lets you do some cool stuff with Bone Splitters where you can kind of play a warband that's just like a huge pile of abilities. Um, and so kind of here's an example of how I would do that, right? Uh, you could take the Mighty Maniac Weird Knob. Now this is a weird one. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry for that pun. I didn't even do that on purpose. Um, but the Mighty Maniac Weird Knob has a kind of not very good attack profile in melee, 4414. It's reasonable, but it also has um, the Wizard Blast and it sits on a bore so it moves 10 inches. But what's cool about this Wizard Blast is that you can spend a double to get plus one attacks on it uh, with weird squig. And then so if you give it plus one strength, you can actually have three of those powerful Wizard Blast 3-6 attacks. One thing that makes the Wizard Blast kind of annoying for me is that um, it just whiffs a lot when you only have two dice. But when you have a third dice on just a double, uh, now normally still that's a lot of resources, but now Bone Splitters are just like getting doubles all over the place um, because of their initiative roll ability. And so that just puts you in a wonderful spot um, where you know, you'll know you just have all these doubles to spend. Why not do it on getting an, another dice on your Wizard Blasts? All of a sudden those blasts are kind of threatening to take over the game and that's really powerful and a really great place to be. Uh, then you have Savage Big Stabbers. That's a way for Bone Splitters to get kind of a more respectable damage profile out. Uh, then four Savage Orcs with Chompa and Shield. They're just very survivable um, for 80 points. You get move four, you get 15 wounds. It's a, it's a nice place to be. And then a Savage Orc more boy. And then you can actually have 15 points here to uh, put a blessing out there, uh, whether it's a sort of big stabba that you want to give um, some extra stuff to, or, you know, there's just a lot that you can play with. But you still get just a ton of different ways to utilize your dice here. Charge, tooth shiv, um, you have multiple rampagers that are pretty solid, like your big stabbas rampage so well, and you're going to have a lot more triples with primal beliefs, because let's say you rolled, say, uh, two doubles and two singles. This is the most common roll in Warcry initiative, and one of those two singles is a one, then you already have two results where that one can just give you a triple and now you can just put a wild dice on and have a rampage. That's wild, right? So if you just roll that one, you have a one in three chance of just like getting yourself to a rampage. And that's sort of on top of your already chances at having natural triples, right? So you're just going to have a lot more rampages, a lot more doubles to play with. It's just going to be a really good situation for you. So um, there's kind of a lot to really like with this Bone Splitters trait. And I know it like reads kind of subtle, but the effect on the game is is big. So um, Bone Splitters are kind of back in business for this one year. I know they've been kind of moved to the old world. I'd be very shocked if they were in Warcry in third edition. But if you just have a bunch of Bone Splitters lying around, uh, consider taking them for, for a whirl because I actually think that this um, this trait can have a really big effect on the game. Speaking of traits with a really big effect on the game, <laughs> let's talk about the other orcs, Iron Jaws. Um, their trait is wild. Enough messin is what it's called. Each time an enemy fighter makes a weight action, each player whose warband has this battle trait can pick one friendly fighter. That fighter makes a bonus move action up to three inches. Now, there's some interesting things with this. For example, before when I played pure Iron Jaws, I often liked to play Big Pig to uh, give Iron Jaws kind of a way to move around the board a little more quickly. But here, you're kind of incentivized not to use Big Pig because your bonus move action can only be three, even if you're pigging. Um, so what it does do, though, is it eases up the pressure on some of these really big, stompy, really hitty 
Iron Jaws pieces that only have three inch move, um, especially like the Mega Boss with that giant pie plate base, uh, just will have an easier time moving around if it has those three inches. Most of the time, your opponent is just going to be too scared to wait. Uh, they're just they're not going to want to give you those three inches, so they're just going to not wait. But that gives you all kinds of bonuses in other places. I got to test out this battle trait and. Um, I actually did the waiting and my opponent um, had to kind of not wait and actually just like position right away. And so I was actually able to kind of hold up and then get attacks in with my mega boss um, by just like move, charge and get an attack in uh, without any kind of reprisal because they were all done activating, right? Um, so that was a really good place for me to be. I, I tested this exact list in that situation. And so the sort of way that you can wait with your opponent not feeling comfortable doing it just is incredibly powerful for you. Um, it's not just powerful against hordes. In fact, I would actually, having played it now, I actually think it's at its most powerful against like eight and nine model warbands where they're not hordes, but they've got some numbers. They've got a few chaff in there whose job is to wait so that they can have their sort of big scary pieces set up for something really high impact. Um, all of a sudden, that play style of like draw things out a little bit and then hit you really hard with a hammer unit is impossible to execute. So, you know, a horde, whenever I played Nurgle, for example, um, and I had a lot of success with Nurgle. I was 12 and 0 in tournaments. I rarely waited. I almost never waited because my philosophy was I had more fighters than you anyway, most of the time. So I actually wanted to put a lot of pressure on you by just like moving those plague bearers forward and like pressuring you with their attack characteristic, pressuring you with their ability to score a ton of points, right? Like they're only move three, so they're not really able to like wait and then get to an objective. So I'm like pushing them forward to these objectives, daring you to come meet them and find out how much damage uh, they actually do over time, things like that. So like horde warbands can actually afford not to wait much, but it's these like eight, nine, sometimes also the 10 fighter warbands because they usually only have one big impact piece that they really have to get the most out of. Uh, those are the warbands that are going to be really affected by this. Um, and that's a great place to be with Iron Jaws. It's so cool. So uh, being able to shut down that kind of uh, tempo play that your opponent wants to do is really wonderful. I've also just built the fairest list possible here in terms of uh, like blessings, none of those here. Um, but you do get like lots of very cute abilities. So for example, you get two brutes. Um, those of course have you messing and they have duff up the big thing. Uh, you get your mega boss who is just like big and chunky and fights. Um, so there's just a lot to love out of this Iron Jaws list. When I played it, I had a ton of fun. Um, it's both very powerful and just very fair. Like it plays Warcry uh, the way Warcry is meant to be played with no waiting. Sylvaneth also have one of the coolest ones. I'm just like, this is just a video of me being excited about various factions. Um, the Sylvaneth one is called Spirit Pathways. Once per battle, a friendly fighter with this battle trait can use the Walk the Spirit Paths ability without needing or spending any ability dice, and can use this ability as if they had the Warrior Rune Mark. Amazing. First of all, the Warrior Rune Mark is the one that Tree Revenants have. So basically anything that's not a tree revenant can still kind of blink around, which is amazing. It's just once per battle, but it's a triple, and it's one of the highest impact triples in the game if you are putting it on something that's not a tree rev. Um, the best thing to put it on is a Kurnoth Huntmaster with Scythe and plus one attack. Uh, normally Kurnoth Huntmasters, I find them a little frustrating. They have only three attacks, um, three six damage. It's on average, if you're doing it over and over and over, it um, averages out to like a really respectable profile, but it just, it's so swingy that it can be very frustrating to uh, to play with. But what's cool about the Huntmaster with Scythe and plus one attack, yes, you're playing paying 275 points, but you're rolling five dice instead of three, which is just wild. Um, it's especially important because this does count as an ability. So once you teleport, you can't 
um, you can't use another ability. Now, why do we have the sides? Uh, normally, when I used to build Sylvaneth Warbands, I would go almost entirely swords. And the reason for that is that swords do about the same amount of damage as the sides do. You can, you know, calculate it out. It's almost exactly the same. Um, but they cost 15 fewer points, which is wild. Uh, two inch range, whether or not that's worth 15 fewer points. If they had the exact same profile, I'd be more interested. But given that the sword is just a more consistent profile over time, um, I think the sword is a much better place to be if you are, say, having Sylvaneth in a not battle trait warband, or you know, if you have other things that you're doing with Sylvaneth. Um, but once you have that battle trait, it's really nice to have the scythe because walk the spirit paths says that you have to be outside of five from your opponent. And the threat range of the scythe is six inches, which is great. So you have to be outside of five, but then you can still come in and get an attack. Um, now you can't use onslaught for that attack. And part of the attraction to scythes is that they scale with onslaught so well. But... Um, that's where the plus one attack blessing comes in, and it's very good here. So uh, that Kurnoth Hunter with Scythe can just do, uh, this is the Hunt Master. Uh, the average damage is really amazing. It's not quite efficient enough to have ever been like a major piece of competitive play, but that was before this battle trait, before you could just teleport it around the board and have it attack whatever vulnerable thing from the opponent you uh, want to get rid of. So... I put here a little chart to show you your chances of killing something in one hit because I think that's really important as far as the uh, utility that this brings, right? Uh, a T4 12 wound model, just a random dwarf, um, you can kill it in one hit two thirds of the time. That's wild. Um, even toughness 4, 15 wound, like orcs and stuff, you still have like a slightly worse than coin flip chance of taking them out once. Um, once that moves up to toughness five, it's really hard, but even hit killing them one in four times is not the worst. So you'll you'll definitely manage to like put a lot of damage on them and make it so that even once they disengage, it's going to be pretty easy to take them out at some point. So it's an incredibly good thing for clearing up chaff. It's also great though because they can kind of get the party started against another elite fighter too so that they can then take them out next turn something like that um it's also just totally fine on any of your other fighters for just teleporting once to uh just get into place for an objective one of the things i found when i played sylvaneth was i never felt like i only had eight fighters my sylvaneth list at the time only had eight partly because at the time i did have a um old guard from dispossessed in the list but also because i felt like i could always use my bodies the most efficient way possible because i could teleport at the end of the round to whatever objective uh needed a body which was incredibly powerful the last thing i wanted to talk about with this list there's just so many there's so many layers to this it's it's so cool there's so many cool things you can do with sylvaneth now but you get to have three spite revenants. They have a really good net that can just lock enemies in place. So not only are you teleporting around the board, but you are also kind of locking down and constraining your enemy's movement. Uh, then you get Carthane, which is amazing because he has a plus one attack aura that scales really well with scythes, of course. But it also um, just like is good generally like the sword can be in there the revenants can be in there spite revenants are actually kind of deadly which is a really nice place to be um so carthane just gives you like more and more utility uh so you can just like attack your opponent in so many different ways which is really wonderful you can also um like teleport carthane around the board so that next turn you'll be able to like use the triple to do a wholly different team fight than what you had before that puts you in a really powerful place a lot of the time in war cry you can get kind of um you can get to this point where in round two you really choose where the fights are going to be that you care about and then in round three and four sometimes you're just kind of like riding it out to see what happens Sylvaneth never has to settle for that uh, anymore, at least. Uh, you can always just like teleport Carthane around to 
you know, change a fight that's already happened, or you can teleport your Kurnoth Huntmaster to go join a different fight. Um, it's really powerful like, like that. And then even once you've used your once per battle teleporter, uh, you still got your tree revenant who can sort of bounce around the board as well. So there's just a lot to play around with with this Sylvaneth list. Um, a lot of cool stuff you can do. So I'm, I'm very excited about Sylvaneth. They're, they're really cool. Iron Golems. Iron Golems have always been one of those factions where the profiles are just very respectable, but the abilities are so bad. Usually you can get away with having just really good profiles and bad abilities, and in casual play, Iron Golems are very good, but uh, they've never really been in competitive play because the abilities are kind of problematic, or like so bad they're problematic, and then um, even in casual play, I feel like sometimes you feel a little constrained, like you if you like get cute with which fighters you bring at all, then you're like really suffering because the only way you can win is by beating your opponent on like positioning and efficiency. And uh, so like your lack of abilities can be incredibly punishing. Luckily, Iron Golems now have We Make War. After the initiative phase, starting with the attacker, each player whose warband has this battle trait can pick a double, triple, or quad they have. Change the value of those ability dice to six. Almost every other faction that has a thing that messes or a trait that messes with the value of their ability dice, they almost always have to like jump through some hoop for it. Uh, both Zeech factions have to jump through a hoop for it. There's a few others that have to kind of do weird stuff to make it happen. But here, it just happens four times, right? Every round, it happens once. That's amazing. Um, and it lets you do a lot of other cool stuff. So first, you get to have two Ogre Breachers. Now, you can play two Ogre Breachers anyway in Iron Golems, right? But what makes the Ogre Breachers a little more interesting here, they, of course, have that 4-8 damage profile, which is a really wonderful thing to have, but they still have to get into combat, and sometimes they can kind of get taken down while they're like waiting to fight again because they're not particularly fast. No, nothing in your warband is very fast other than the drill master. Um, and you don't have a ton of fighters, so you can't like wait out your opponent uh, very easily. But now something that you can do, they have that charge ability. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called. It's like a quarter of the warbands in the game have this ability. It's not used very often, but it's the triple that just deals damage equal to the value of your dice uh, when you end within one inches of some something. And that's incredibly powerful if it is guaranteed to be on a six. The normal issue is like triples are often, you know, you don't have a ton of agency over what your triples are on. And if it's on like threes or fours or twos, it's just so embarrassing to spend an entire triple to get that little damage. But now you can really blow stuff up with these Ogre Breachers. If something is within five inches of you, you can move up, deal six right away, and then get an attack in. That's wild. Um, even if something's pretty far away, you can get with nine inches of threat range, you can put six damage out, which can uh, finish off a lot of fighters. It can um, just get the party started for next round where all of a sudden you're really favored to uh, kill something that's really big. Um, it just makes it so that even some of the biggest fighters in the game actually have to kind of respect your Ogre Breachers and kind of stay away from them. Um, so for like 208 or 220 points, you can be kind of giving 300 point fighters the heebie-jeebies which is really great because you have two of them which is wild and so now you can threaten it in multiple places which is a really good place to be um so that's just really powerful this also can be used on quads which i included the drill master here the drill master has a quad that lets you do deal damage equal to the value of the dice to every fighter within three inches of the drill master which is kind of flavorful and fun because the drill master has that uh, whip with three inch range um, the threat of being able to put out 18 damage is wild. And the Drill Master is a little faster than the rest of the Warband. You move five with the Drill Master. She is, you know, your one quick thing. And so her ability to threaten, like, I can run 10 inches and put 18 damage out is just silly. Now, quads, you never build around them, right? But just including a fighter who's kind of respectable anyway, um, 
and kind of add something that the rest of your warband doesn't have anyway. Uh, and then just having that out for maybe I have a quad, I make it a six. Now I have, like the world is my oyster, right? Because I can rampage on a six with the ogre breachers, which is terrifying. I can put out 18 damage on a six with the drill master, which is terrifying. Or I can rampage with this dominar, which is almost as terrifying as the ogre breachers. I wanted to put plus one damage on the do on the dominar um, because it's only 25 points. Uh, so you get a five point discount from what it normally is on most fighters you're blessing. But um, the plus one damage is nice because the dominar already has five strength. And so it actually, it's a really cool math thing, right? Because uh, one, it does add a tiny, tiny bit little more damage than plus one attack would here, which is always fun because plus one attack is usually the uh, like go-to when you want to buff the attack power or your know, damage potential of one of your big fighters. But the next thing it does, yes, plus one attack can help for DPA six compared to plus one damage, but it makes it so that Spine Crushing Blow has way more of an effect than it normally does. So normally Spine Crushing Blow will add 2.66 to the amount of damage you deal to uh, Toughness 6. does it for 7 too because uh, it just adds a ridiculous amount of strength. Um, so Spine Crushing Blow can make it so that you you know, get a nice little benefit, but when you have plus 1 damage, it becomes a huge benefit. Uh, plus four expected damage with this plus one damage is like pretty wild. Whereas plus one attack would only add 3.33. So it's just like these little math things that I have a ton of fun with. Um, spine crushing blow also is uh, something that you can put on sixes here with We Make War. And it makes the Dominar and the Ogre Breacher, uh, the only things in the game, I think, that can hit Vexmoor on threes, which is wild. So, like, Vexmoor actually has to be terrified of an opposing Dominar. Now, you're still paying 15 more points than what Vexmoor costs for the privilege. Yes, Vexmoor is way too point sufficient, um, but it is cool to have a little way to, uh, you know, throw paper to Vexmoor's rock here, uh, which is really nice. So uh, then I've just kind of filled out the warband with three Iron Legionaries with shields. Uh, that Toughness 5 is just great. Uh, when you have all of these kind of big fighty things running around, it's really nice if your little stuff is just really hard to kill so that your opponent can't like just shut you down. Basically, you want to be able to do the exact same thing that I said in Iron Jaws that uh, Iron Jaws can shut down now where you want to be able to make kind of cute tempo plays with your three iron legionaries and then set up your real fighty things for like more impactful um you know activities uh and so having your iron legionaries be really hard to kill is just like hugely helpful for that we've got fire slayers we're getting towards the end uh fire slayers i just went with naked baby swarm um so their trait is runic momentum after a friendly fighter with this battle trait uses an ability, add one to their move characteristic for the next move action they make this activation. Um, and what I like about this one is that there's some subtle play to it that's kind of sweet. So I've set up a warband here with a Hearthguard Berserker Carl, a Doomseeker, two Auric Hearthguard. Those are the ones that uh, spew lava from like a, a thing that looks like a melee weapon, but is apparently like a lava rifle. I don't get it, but that's okay. Um, then a Hearthguard Berserker with Broadaxe, and then six Volkites with the Shield. The thing that I like about this battle trait is that you can kind of use it to play double duty in different places, especially with Encase in Molten Rock and Onslaught. So Encase in Molten Rock is you just say that your next attack is going to sap the uh, movement from your opponent. It's really cool, right? But you can, with Runic Momentum, you can use in case in Molten Rock before you've done any activating. Then you move, 
and you have plus one to your movement. And so now you can track things down that you maybe couldn't before, or you can just have that four inch movement for free. You were gonna try to get onto an objective or something anyway. Um, so just having that extra positioning is really valuable and then you shoot something, right? Um, the other thing is like onslaught you can now use to give you plus one move to catch something that you couldn't normally catch. And then you still get the plus one dice when you attack it, which is really cool. Um, there is like, I think untamed beasts have that ability and it's like one of the best abilities in their roster there, uh, getting like plus one move and then plus one attack. And so being able to do that here, um, just with your battle trait, you just kind of get to turn Onslaught into that ability is really powerful and really cool. It also scales with Duty Unto Death. Uh, this is a triple that gives you a Rampage if you've taken five damage. Uh, and I've got two fighters here who can do it, the Hearthguard Berserker Carl and the Hearthguard Berserker with Broadaxe. So if either of them end up taking five damage, you can just use Duty Unto Death and now your sort of movement is uh, four inches instead of three, which again, this doesn't sound like a lot, but like the the transition from three to four is just so valuable in game. Uh, you also get to use this for uh, the Fire Slayer's ability that adds plus three to your movement once. Now you're adding plus four to your movement once. That's pretty cool too. So there's just a lot of really fun, subtle stuff you can do with this that I think is powerful. And you're going to have six toughness five, 12 wound little dwarves that are really hard to shift. And so you can like really swamp the board in kind of a crazy way here. Um, and then hopefully just get like a lot of value from your abilities from the, uh, you know, five fighters who can play some offense for you. Finally, last but certainly not least is Nighthawk. And here's how I would mess around with Night Haunt with this uh, trait existing now. Uh, I would, ha I'm calling it jump scares because the idea here is to kind of move then attack, right? Uh, so I would go with a wielder of the blade with plus one attack. Uh, it, it's part of an Underworld's Warband, but if you just like have a Lord Executioner, wielder of the blade is just the unique Lord Executioner. That's all it really is. So just use that. No one will know. Uh, then play five chain rasps, two spirit hosts, and a dread scythe harridan. Now, there's a couple things you can do here. One is if you don't like the harridan, and I'm going to try to convince you on why you should like it. But if you don't like the harridan, you can take a glaive ray stalker, and then you get to give plus one strength to one of your spirit hosts, which is really powerful because then that boosts it up to four strength, and then the wave of terror can get it to five which is really crazy with um, Frightful Touch, which makes all hits into crits. So if you do get to where you're hitting on threes with a Spirit Host, that is like absolutely insane. So if your opponent's Warband has a lot of high toughness things, uh, you might want to do that. Like if you expect to see Stormcast, which are just like toughness five across the board, except for when they're toughness six, it might be really nice to be able to count to toughness five with your Spirit Hosts. Uh, so that you can get some really big frightful touches. Um, Wielder of the Blade also is really cool here because it normally has strength five um, and just like a really nice attack profile if you can get those hits. And so now you go up to strength six, which means you can really smush anything in the game other than a shield annihilator. So that's just like an incredibly powerful place to be for Wielder of the Blade. It's certainly the biggest winner out of this trait. Finally, the Dread Scythe Harridan is kind of cool as like a cheap little piece. It's What's cool about it is you have five attacks, strength three, of course, one, three. And the nice thing there is with five attacks, you are just rolling so many dice, you're going to get a wide spread of rolls. So that plus one strength from Wave of Terror is much more likely to matter here. Uh, also, the Dread Scythe Harridan has a bad net ability. It's it's on a triple instead of a double, but that's okay. Um, you'll only use it when you are like incredibly desperate for a net, and that's totally fine, right? The main thing here is that you are going to be rolling those kind of whatever the distant the difference is that's allowing you to have that um, those fours 
or like the strength four, you're going to be rolling that extra dice um, much more often with the Dread Scythe Herodin. So you are going to get the extra damage boost um, just like much more consistently. The other interesting thing here is you know spirit hosts and harridans because they have so many attacks they can often be incredibly vulnerable to counter and that's something that your chain rasps help a bunch with the key to night haunt right now i see that uh when i do kind of meta uh like tracking stuff like that I see that night haunt's win rate hasn't actually gone up that much since they got a whole bunch of buffs and I think it's because people are like experimenting with a lot of stuff and trying out Night Haunt and realizing that Night Haunt's play style is not the most intuitive. And I'm just very excited for people to kind of figure out how to play them. And a big part of that is just being incredibly cowardly with your Chain Rasps, using them to wait a whole bunch. Um, one of the cool things about Chain Rasps is they have that very small base and they also have a uh, flying and six inch move. And so they can often just like be on an objective, wait once, and then still be able to run over to the other objective if they decide, if the Night Haunt player decides that uh, the points that way work out a little bit better. Or you can like wait and then kind of run away more effectively or like move around the board more effectively really easily with, with, uh, chain rasps so they let you kind of fly around the board avoid your opponent and then also kind of manipulate the tempo of activations really nicely so that you can uh, get the like most powerful impact out of your spirit hosts and your wielder of the blade that you can possibly get your spirit hosts and harridan are going to be just much more resistant to counter than they normally would be um, in kind of a, a situation that would normally just punish them so hard. So that's just a really wonderful place to be. Um, yes, you can still use the Glaive Wraith, but, but you don't need to because you have all of these options here. And so it's really nice to have nine fighters with, uh, with Night Haunt now. So there's just, there's a lot to like with Night Haunt. Um, and I think people can do a lot of winning with them, even though I'm seeing the kind of tournament win rate not be very good. I think they're incredibly powerful. Um, and I hope people try like putting some tips for how to play Night Haunt into the chat under this video, because um, I think it's, a, it's really cool what, you know, the Warcry devs have, have done to kind of save this faction. And it'd be nice to see people kind of do well with it. So... That is seven lists for seven battle traits that uh, has kind of exhausted my creative energy for this week, but I'm very excited about this kind of new development with Warcry. I think the battle traits, like, yes, there are some haves and some have-nots, but it's some incredibly important, like, internal balance where anyone who is just, like, being cute and bringing kind of a, a faction... Uh, thematic warband was just like really getting punished because right now the kind of competitive war cry rules demand that you uh, basically be allying as much as you possibly can. I'll talk about this more like next time I do a meta roundup, but it's getting like now that they've nerfed some things that really needed nerfs, but now that they've nerfed like the first round of really kind of broken stuff, it's uh more and more clear how borked the ally system is and so them giving you like a legitimate reason to not use it is really wonderful i think for most competitive players they're going to ignore these battle traits but for people who want to rock up to a competitive tournament with a more thematic list which by the way is about like 50 or 60 percent of the warcry community that tends to do that um these battle traits are going to be amazing because they're just going to be this like small little bonus you get um, that you can maybe build around or maybe just not build around and just have in your back pocket anyway, uh, which is just such a wonderful addition to the game, I think. So I'm very excited about them. I'll probably do more battle trait list building videos in the future. Um, pure list building videos tend not to be the most popular on the channel, but I love them so much and I hope that you guys love them too. So next time you play one of these lists, may all your rolls be crits.